Today we're joined on the phone by Matthew Clickstein. He's the author of the book Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's Golden Age. How are you doing today, Matthew? I'm doing just a little bit fine. Beautiful. And I got to assume, I know that I am the age that Nickelodeon was a huge part of my childhood, and I'm assuming you must be right around the same age. So is that what inspired you to write this book, or what was that all about? Yeah, there was a, a confluence of a few different things, actually. Uh, you know, uh, like many people, I was a frustrated writer. Uh, I had, had some moderate successes when I was younger, uh, a couple things in film and TV and journalism. But, you know, I just I, the, the big project was still eluding me, and um, I was making a big transition in my life, leaving Hollywood and L.A., and I didn't really know where I'd go next. This was about 2008, 2009. And I just got into my head to write a book about Nickelodeon. It didn't seem like something someone had really done yet before. It seemed like something I knew a lot about, something I really loved, something I'd be able to invest a lot of my time and energy into. And, you know, it was always just in the back of my mind. I never really moved forward with it. Um, but uh, about yeah, two years ago, I started actually taking it seriously. And now here we are. And I've had a chance to look at the book, and it's beautiful, by the way. And, um, I mean, you've had everybody in this book that was involved in Nickelodeon back in the early days. Uh, how were you able to track down, you know, all these original players? Well, if I told you that, everyone would be able to do it. That was a little <laughs> trick on my part. No, I, you know, I've always been really good at that. It's a, it's a little trick I've done ever since I was a kid. I used to write to random people when I was younger, like fifth, sixth grade, and, and really weird people, especially for a fifth or sixth grader, like Phil Stiller and people like that, uh, Meg Ryan. Um, and, you know, in college, friends of mine probably remember, I used to actually get messengered cease and desist letters because I would just track down these random people and uh, write them, you know, I, I found Roman Polanski in his office in Paris and, you know, all different kinds of folks. I just, you know, I figured it out. Um, I actually, I didn't even have Facebook or any real social media connections when I uh, was doing the interview process of this book. And, uh, you know, you find, hey, someone dedicated something to someone else in a book or a movie. I looked that person up. Oh, they run a a store in New Jersey somewhere. I called him up. He helped me get in touch. I mean, it was completely random every time. There was a positive spiral that started happening, as Bill Gates would call it, where, um, you know, once people started realizing I was doing this and, and they started liking what I was doing, they started helping me get in touch with other folks. Um, so I owe a lot to those people themselves, like Mark Summers and Mitchell Kriegman, who created Clarissa Plains at all, and a few others who just really, really liked me, really liked what I was doing, believed in it and helped me to get in touch with a few of the other people. But no, much of it was just legwork and just running around and finding them. Like, and I just did. And every person was a different challenge, so. So was this book, like, years in the making? Or, I mean, how long did it take you to compile all this stuff? I had to work fast, a lot faster than I would have liked. Um, but it's understandable just because once we really started taking it seriously, it was right around that time that Nickelodeon started releasing its uh, 90s block again and, some of the Pete and Pete reunions were happening and we just started to realize that the zeitgeist was really peaking and it was time to get something going and quick. Like I actually turned the book in last November, but we just held it off for, you know, Christmas season and that kind of thing. So it's been done for a while now. Um, they gave me about six months to do it. Originally gave me three. I had to beg for six. Um, and I had done a few interviews beforehand, just kind of uh, piecemeal on my own. Um, I, my very first interview was Jim Jenkins, which was literally uh, uh, two Septembers ago. Um, but I didn't even do anything with that until, you know, like maybe a year and a half ago or something like that. So um, the real bulk of it was done in about six months. Now, is there somebody that uh, you weren't able to track down that you wish you could have? I know you had most of the people, but uh, maybe there was one or two. Um, not really. You know, I was really lucky. Everyone I wanted to get, I pretty much got. Um, you know, there were a few people who said no, and I kind of let them go. There were a few people who I tried to get and, you know, just didn't work out. And I said, oh, you know, oh, well. But uh, for the most part, I got everybody I really wanted and really chased after. Um, I kind of would have liked to have gotten Alanis Morissette for You Can't Do That on Television. But unfortunately, right when we started looking for her was when her new album dropped. And even her management hardly knew where she was on tour. I even actually have a friend who has a friend who used to be a boyfriend of hers. And he was getting in touch with her for me. And it sounded like something that we were trying to get going. But she just literally left on this like wide tour right when I was doing it. It wasn't going to be possible. Um, Arlene Clapke also, uh, one of the creators of Rugrats, Clapke Chupo, uh, we didn't get her, and she's someone I would have liked to have gotten, um, cause we even got Gabor Chupo, um, and pretty much everyone else from Rugrats, but uh, Arlene just didn't want to speak to me. Uh, she was probably the only person I really, really wanted to get that I didn't get, um, and we, we worked hard to try to get her. I mean, even Jerry Laybourne, the president of Nickelodeon, tried to get her for me, 
Um, but she just she clearly doesn't really want to talk about Rugrat stuff. I think it was a very difficult period in her life, frankly, especially the years that I'm focusing on. There was a lot of tension between she and the writing staff, which is uh, talked about in the book. So I think that's probably why she didn't want to speak to me. But she was, she was pretty much it. And Alanis was only on You Can't for a couple of episodes, and we have some stuff about her in the book. So, I, you know, after a while, I was just like, eh, I got a lot of other people from You Can't, so that's okay. But Arlene would have been nice. Arlene would have been a good one. That's pretty much it. Yeah, and I have personally had uh, the pleasure of interviewing a few of these people before. I'm not as many, obviously, as you have. But when you were growing up, I mean, it must be a trip to think, you know, nowadays that you are probably personal friends with a lot of these people that were, you know, a big part of your childhood. You know, it's, I, I say the same thing to everyone when they ask me this question, which is it's weird that it's not weird. Um, I just very quickly became friendly with a lot of these folks. And I think that that really bespeaks a lot about who these people are whether they're the creators of the shows, the writers, the producers, uh, the stars of the shows, or whatever it might be. I mean, these are really down-to-earth people. I spoke to about 250 people, and I had maybe two or three kind of semi-divas at most. Um, Everyone else was really, really sweet. They were really easy to talk to. They were happy to contribute. They were happy to speak to me. I mean, they were just great folks that I'm sure you found and the people you've talked to. And, uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've become very, very close with Mark Summers. Uh, I've become very, very close with Jason Zimbler, who was Ferguson on Clarissa. And it's funny, you know, I, I, he, he lives in New York where I live, and we hang out. And uh, I got to a point recently where I stopped telling friends, you know, hey, come out, come hang out with me and Ferguson. I just say, hey, come out with my friend Jason and I. And I mentioned that to him. I, I didn't realize they did it. He goes, yeah, that happens after a while. You know, he's just my friend Jason, who, oh, by the way, happens to be Ferguson from Clarissa. So uh, it's kind of cool when that can happen. But, again, I just I think it really says a lot about who these people are. Mike Morona, Danny Zambarelli. I mean, these, these, they're just really nice, fun people who, you know, I text pictures to, and they text pictures back, and we make little jokes, and, you know, we talk every now and then, or we hang out, or whatever it might be. And, you know, they're just they're our friends. They are around our age, and, uh, you know, they were a lot like us then. They're a lot like us now. So, you know, I think that that says a lot about the network and the kind of talent they were going for. Definitely. Again, we're on the phone today with Matthew Clickstein. He's the author of the book Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's golden age. And uh, one thing that I kind of noticed when I've spoken to a few of these people is uh, some of them seem to be, you know, really surprised with sort of the resurgence in popularity for these uh, early Nick shows. Did you did you find that to be the case? Absolutely. Um, you know, that was actually a really big part of the book even. Um, you know, one thing that a lot of people forget because we were so bombarded by these shows when we were younger. Nick syndicated these shows. Um, many of these shows were only on for a couple seasons. I mean, we love Pete and Pete now, but back then it didn't do very well, frankly, and it was only on for three seasons. Um, that's not a lot of episodes. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that's not a lot of time that these young people, uh, even a lot of the creators and producers who were themselves in their 20s, maybe 30s at the oldest, uh, spent on, you know, 20 years ago. When I spoke to a lot of the kids from the Midnight Society for Are You Afraid of the Dark, for example, um, they did all of the intros to every episode in, in a very quick kind of marathon, two or three week uh, stint. Uh, and so one of the guys I talked to, I think it was Jacob Turney, uh, said, you know, this is like you're talking to me about a commercial I shot 20 years ago. Or a lot of the, you can't do that on television people. You know, back then, uh, nobody had, you know, really cared about it in Canada where they were shooting it. It was sort of the stupid little public service thing that they were doing after school instead of soccer. So they were surprised about it then. Now they're really surprised. And there's, there's definitely times where I talk to some of these people. They're well into their late 30s now. And they say, wait, do people really care about this stuff still? Or wait, what are you, what are you doing? Like you're doing a book about this? I mean, it, it has been very shocking to them. And then you have people like a lot of the Pete and Peters where there's been reunions and things. And they can really tell what an in, impact they've had. And they're, they're just blown away, and they're very happy. Uh, you know, and I'll wrap that up with Catherine Beekman's actually a film professor at Columbia University. And she says one of her greatest pleasures is she can literally see very directly the influence uh, Pete and Pete has had on some of her students in the way that they write and the way that they're making their films and that kind of thing. And, you know, it's very exciting for them. So it, it has been a lot of fun. I think for these folks, they, they've all they've all brought that up. Yeah, they're they're all very very surprised. This is this is these little shows that they did 20 years ago. Some of them for maybe a year at most, and you know then they moved on with their lives. So to hear that it actually hit us and actually changed the culture in this way is definitely very surprising for a lot of these people. Pleasantly so. Yeah, I guess it just goes to show you never know um, which project you do that might uh, be the one that inspires somebody else for sure. 
yeah, I mean, it just, it makes you wonder, like, you know, some silly little, like, play that you did with your friends when you were younger that, you know, got filmed or something by someone's parents got, you know, passed around or some little chat book that you made or some little, like, a comic book or something, you know, can really go through the system. And 20, 30 years later, you know, suddenly it's hit all these people. I mean, you just never know. And, and I think that that's a really exciting thing about our culture still to this day, even with the Internet and everything else, that that can happen. You know, Roger Price, who is uh, the creator of You Can't Do That on Television, he left entertainment and kind of culture in general uh, right after You Can't uh, got started and went to south of France. Uh, a lot of people didn't think I'd be able to get him, actually. And uh, I believe him. I've gone through the emails, and I've talked to him a lot. He really did not know that Nickelodeon happened. And he kind of was shocked and surprised and even a little angry, uh, rightly so, because he's basically the creator of Slime and just kind of feels like they took this little silly thing that he invented and created this billion dollar industry on it of which he makes no money at all uh so it's kind of funny to, to think of that that you could make this silly stupid little thing 30 years ago green slime and suddenly there's an entire you know network and merchandising machine and the whole thing it's, it's very interesting to talk to him he's probably the best example of wait what's going on so it's kind of funny <laughs> Yeah, and then when you were talking to these people, or you know, maybe your opinion as well, what are your thoughts on Nickelodeon now? Does anyone feel like uh, maybe it's lacking the magic, or are they, I mean, happy in the direction that it's gone, or what do you think? You know, it's hard to say, honestly, because, again, one of my few regrets about the book, it's not really regret, but it's just the nature of publishing and marketing and that kind of thing. Again, I finished the book last November. The bulk of these interviews were done last year, some of them even earlier than that. Uh, and there's been some things that have changed since November, certainly since last year. Uh, Will McRobb and Chris Viscardi, creators of uh, Pete and Pete, for example, were very vocal about the way that Nickelodeon had changed uh, over the years. Uh, and most of them did say that, yeah, the magic is gone. It's, you know, this big business machine now. It's not the same thing that it used to be, et cetera. But, you know, within the last, you know, month or two, Will and Chris are now back at Nick, uh, executive producing, gosh, I always blank on the name of the show, but a new cartoon by the Bob's Burgers guys. And, uh, you know, they've been very excited about it. And a lot of people are saying, you know, that might be a resurgence of the Golden Age type animation. Uh, Craig Bartlett, who is one of the big guys at Rugrats, one of the creators of Hey Arnold, is doing a show over there now. And, you know, I know personally some of the people over at Nickelodeon now, a lot of them are very excited about this book coming out. A lot of them are our age and grew up on these shows. And I think that they are trying to push Nick into doing more of the kind of 80s, 90s Nick stuff again. Um, because, again, we have people our age who grew up on these shows now as producers and execs and such at Nick and have that kind of power or starting to get that kind of power. So we might see that transition happen in the next year or two. Um, and especially, you know, I would imagine with this book coming out and getting everyone to remember like, oh, yeah, there was something really special about Ren and Stimpy or Sleet Your Shorts that, you know, let's be honest, iCarly or Dora just might not have. Um, you know, it, it, it has an other kind of magic. It's, you know, has, you know, magic with merchandising, magic with money, magic with some other things. Dora is very educational uh, and deals with the diversity thing. But, you know, it's not Ren and Stimpy. It's not Doug. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think we might see some, some changes happen if we haven't yet already. And again, Matthew, can you uh, kind of tell us when the book's coming out, you know, where we can get it and that sort of thing? The book, uh, Slime, and Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age, is coming out uh, September 24th. It'll be in stores everywhere, all over the world. Penguin's putting it out, so it's nice to have a major publisher behind it, really pushing it and promoting it. Uh, you can pre-order it online if it's before September 24th when you're listening to this at Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, and all those good spots. Uh, you can actually also get an audiobook version of it and, of course, the ebook versions, although... Um, I personally, just if I make, may make a little ad hominem here, I, I uh, would prefer and recommend you actually get the, the hardcover book if you can. As Dustin, just, you just said, it's a beautiful book. You get to see the pictures right in there. Um, you can really hold it there. And, and more importantly, I think there's something to a physical book, um, not just uh, for the author, because when you're reading it on the subway, when you're reading it in a coffee shop or whatnot, people see it. And you have that Viva Voce thing going on of, oh, I didn't know that book was out. I'm going to go buy it. But also for the reader, it can create a real sense of community and bonding. Someone comes over to you and goes, oh, I didn't know that was out. Or, or oh, are you in a Nickelodeon too? And you create a little discussion. That happens to me all the time with books that I have. And you just don't get that with the kind of black monolithic Kindle or Nook or whatnot where people don't know what you're reading. Um, you know, I have friends that work in Amazon. I think they do some great stuff. But I, I think that that's something that we're losing by everyone reading on Kindles and, and, and Nooks is people don't see the books anymore. And that's really a shame. Not to mention, yeah, Slime looks great. It's a great cover design, and I want people to see it. So, um, you know, 
buy the book if you can and support your local bookstore for goodness sake there you go that is uh, matthew clickstein author of the book slimed an oral history of nickelodeon's golden age i read about half of it and i'm going to finish it as soon as i can and thanks again for being on with us today yeah thank you dustin 